Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, just for uh, so I know who I'm talking to, uh, raise the hands. Who uh, knows what computer vision is? Who has used OpenCV? Who writes Python? Who's uh, uh, worked with TensorFlow? Heard of it. Who knows okay. what a neural net is? Awesome. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so we do a lot of computer vision, and uh, because it's really cool, uh, we uh, uh, we want to live in the future, and uh, uh, that doesn't pay the bills, though. So we uh, also do computer vision to uh, to, uh, to to just automate things to make to replace human beings where we can, uh, and uh, so Rosie the robot. So in 2010, uh, there's this competition called Im ImageNet. It started out just being a database of images. Uh, and the competition uh, became to see if you can autonomously, autonomously classify those images. And so this really kicked off. You know, neural nets been around for a long time. You know, AI's been around for a long time. Computer vision has been around for a long time. But uh, it, it just recently uh, got hot. It recently got good. That's a better way to say it. And the difference uh, between when it wasn't good and when it was good is money, uh, is that there was suddenly money in this. And, uh, and you can begin to see in 2011, 2012, uh, the winners of these competitions would, would leave school and go to Google, or leave school and go to Microsoft, and leave school and go over, and then they'd start to partner. So uh, Google won a lot of early competitions, Microsoft won a couple of their CNTA toolkit. Uh, but the reason why things got better was because we put money into it, we put time into it, resources into it. And the neural nets got better fast. Uh, so that, that was the, the difference. So we talk about, you know, we want to live in the future, so we build cool things like that air hockey robot using computer vision. We'll kind of show that and talk about that. Tim built that. Uh, but the reality is that, that uh, we've been wanting to live in the future for a long time. Jetson's been around, Jetson's an old cartoon. Uh, that doesn't actually move us forward. Uh, when you can attach some money to it and put a profit incentive, that's how things like this move forward. So uh, the way that it moved forward, the number one reason why AI moved forward, the ambition moved forward starting about 2010, 2011, 2012, is that uh, Google found a way to, uh, to <coughs> incentivize movement uh, by classifying images. So. Uh, you know, everybody remembers they bought YouTube for over a billion dollars, and people thought they were foolish. This company loses money every month. How, how are you going to do something with this? The two things they did. One, uh, they also at the same time started up a 411 service, an information service. They're in San Francisco. You dial 411, and, and Google just bought an information service. And they started uh, training uh, their neurons that were, that were listen, able to listen to audio, listen to people, and, and know what it is they, were, they wanted. And it had a commercial aspect because you dialed for one because you wanted to go somewhere and buy something. And then the second thing they did is they started competing in these image net competitions. And the whole idea was that they were going to take frames of those YouTube videos right, and then attempt to classify those frames uh, so they can sell you better ads. Because if, you, uh, if you're looking at a video and grab a frame off, I see it's a cat, I can, I can advertise cat food to you and you're more likely to buy the cat food from the advertising. And so they make more money. And that was it. That was all it was, is that if they can increase the odds of you clicking through the ad, uh, then they can make more money. But that was enough to put billions of dollars into computer vision and AI, and that's the real reason we're kind of standing here talking about it right now. So the first problem of computer vision, computer vision, the first thing we want to solve is classification. I've got an image, I have some thing, uh, and I want to know what it is, so I want to classify it. The second problem is localization. Uh, and Localization just falls right out of classification because once you have something that can look at an image or a rectangle and say yes, this is a cat. Well, then you just you just have that that frame be smaller than the image, and you drag that frame across the picture. And in all the spots where you classified cat, it's true, and every spot where you didn't, it's not true. You draw a rectangle around, and there you go. You've got localization. Uh, so it just fell out. It was almost on accident. We didn't. Uh, nobody was you know working towards that necessarily. And then you're one step away from there from from detection. So in 2014, we had the first uh, really good uh, uh, detection. And we brought that with us today. So.
so this is Google's inception model, and it's looking at all of you. But if you've got, you see this guy? You're wearing a t-shirt. Oh, you're a punching bag. That's how good this is. Uh, water bottle, that's pretty good. Rubber what? What is that? Rubber stuff? Rubber eraser. Rubber eraser, that's fantastic. So that was great, right? We can do. We just classified this as a movie theater. That's not bad. That's not terrible, honestly. So, <clears throat> again, if it's driving advertising dollars, then it's driving investment, it's hiring people, and it's putting people on teams looking to, to approve that. Uh, after we have detection, then we have segmentation. Segmentation is uh, necessary for uh, for uh, you know autonomous cars. They want to know you know where the other cars move around. It's good that you can classify it, good that you can localize. But let me let me do segmentation. Uh, but mostly, what it's been good for in the last few years is for Snapchat filters. Uh, it identifies where your face is and then it overlays and does some, some cute stuff. Uh, we use segmentation and we do some kind of cute tricks with. We make the problem easier, uh, and instead of doing segmentation on full cover, color images, uh, we'll do edge detection first before we do uh, the segmentation, before we do anything else, and then we'll extract data from that. Uh, it turns out edges are a lot easier to work with than full images, and uh, so. Add all those up, and you have a self-driving car. Looking at the world around you in a different way. So that's, you know, just from a high level, uh, what those problems are. So, uh, Facebook has asked you to confirm, you know, it identifies you in a picture. It's, yes, I assume nobody in this room uses Facebook, but your mother has been asked by Facebook many times to say, is this you in the picture? Uh, what you're doing is you are providing training data for Facebook so that it can identify your mother and any other picture that somebody else takes a picture uh, takes that picture. Uh, and, and you'd think, oh, this is pretty nefarious. And you'd be right, it's pretty nefarious, but that's not what we're uh, here to talk about. But uh, here we are looking close to the uh, But what I did want to talk about today, because I think it's kind of interesting, the, 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 the kind of one real concept I wanted to talk about was how does this work? How does that uh, work? And, and it seems like we had some, you know, not everybody's a TensorFlow expert, so, uh, so we'll talk about that. Uh, and, and, and why is it so good uh, uh, now? So before we can get that, we need to kind of talk about what, what an image is. Uh, I'm going to do some coding. I'm going to put some live code up. Uh, hands up, who's used Jupyter? Nobody's awesome. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we do. Uh, uh, so we've got OpenCV. There's other uh, other libraries out there that we use pretty commonly. One is Scikit Image. It's not important, but it, well, libraries we use. Uh, the tools we use are, are pretty important. Uh, we use Python primarily to do computer vision. The reason we use Python is because it's uh, it's so good at manipulating matrices of numbers. It's a, it's a mathematical language. The purpose of any language is so that you as a programmer can express yourself succinctly uh, and, and, and get the software to do 
do your bidding, you've got some model in your head, you want to uh, make that model uh, happen in code. Uh, so picking the right tool for the job is great. Every serious person doing computer vision is chosen, is doing it in Python. I mean, there are people doing R and some other, other languages, primarily Python's the language. Again, I'm going to show you why that is. It's, it's uh, fantastic at manipulating matrices and numbers. So this app here is a, a web-based app. It's, it's called Jupyter Notebook. You can do inline markdown and code, which is fantastic. And you can execute that code. So I just kind of prepared a little code we're going to run here. So I initialized some libraries. And uh, I've set this matrix A uh, and filled up with zeros. It's a five by five matrix. Uh, and you can see that uh, yeah, it's five by five matrix of zeros. Uh, just as a point of reference, if we're doing a shape later, you can see it's five by five. I'm going to fill up the center with ones. Uh, you can already see, like, if you're writing this in C sharp or JavaScript or something else, and you wanted to just zero out an array of you know matrix like that, five by five matrix, and then set the middle values to one. It's a little bit less difficult than this. Right? It's a one line expression. There you go. Uh, and 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 so here's the matrix, much of zeros and ones in it. But let's display it as an image because after all. That's all images are. I mean, if you're looking at a 320, uh, 320 by 240 pixel image, what you're really looking at is, uh, you know, a matrix, 320 by 240, and at each value in a black and white image, it's either off or on, right? The pixel either is on or it's off. If it's a grayscale image, it's, a, uh, it's, it's got some variation between black and white, then it's still 320 by 240 pixels, or, you know, it's a matrix. But each value, instead of being a zero or a one, is a number between 0 and 255, right, for how black or how white it is. If you're looking at a color image, uh, who knows how many, I mean, what kind of matrix that looks like? It's got three layers, right? What are those three layers? Red, green, blue. Red, green, and blue. Would you like a t-shirt? You can have a t-shirt. We'll, uh, after the show, can we get a t-shirt? So I think the same uh, matrix we were looking at. I set the center to 0 because, you know, it's a pretty, a pretty pattern. And let's show that picture. There we are. So, really, really simple. Right? Each one of those is a pixel. You can see, you know, zero, zero, all the way across, all the way down. They're just really simple. We're going to resize this because it's not very cool. Uh, and there's that same picture, but resized to 100 by 100. Same thing. Right? Just ones and zeros. Uh, the new shape of this thing, 100 by 100. That's nice black and white. Uh, it's actually grayscale, but. Uh, now we're going to do one with three layers. Now as you look at it, this is again a five by five, uh, but I'm a human being, and this five by five doesn't look like five by five, it looks like five by three, but, yeah, but it is five by five. So we're just going to transpose, well, first we'll look at one of those fields. That x, y coordinate zero, we have a value of zero right now. But I'm going to swap the axes, because I'm a human being, that's the way that I look at matrices. Um, and, and that looks a little more clear, right? Red, green, blue right there, with your five by five. Same five by five, all right? So we're doing the same thing. Oh, we didn't, well, slightly, somewhat the same thing. I'm going to put the entire, uh, the entire face uh, full red, uh, all, all 255s. I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to set the center to zeros there and put 255 on the green layer. Yeah, something like that. And then on the, you know, the blue <laughs> layer is going to be with that dot in the center. Right. So conceptually, and again, I'm sorry, this is, you know, Way, be way below your skill level, uh, heads, but conceptually getting, uh, to understand how computer vision works and why it works so well today, it's kind of important to know that uh, it works so well because photos are just a bunch of numbers. I mean, they're, they're really, uh, and it's not out of reach for anybody to, uh, to interact with the images on that level. So let's take something real, just so you can kind of see that this is still true. I'm not quite sure what you're doing on the resize. Are you just making it from five by five to 100 by 100, and it's just yeah? And we're doing a, a yeah. It's got a range in between, so it's not just part. Yeah. It's yeah. Right? yeah. There's, there's, a, there's okay. 101 libraries out there for doing image resizing. If we had just resized the array without changing the shape at all, you'd have a teeny tiny pixel in the middle. And right. The middle see it if you, uh, but you had, we just decided to stretch it. Okay. All right, so I've loaded up the strawberries JPEG, and uh, here's what it looks like. Nice big fat image, 1400 by 2100 pixels. Uh, we're going to resize that down to make it usable. I'm going to draw a little rectangle. I'm going to take that little section out because it's too much data to show you and be, be reasonable. 
Uh, there's that one little truck, that one little rectangle, and there you go. There's the RGB. But it's just sort of the you know kind of top to bottom conceptually that you know every photograph, every image, every whatever. It's just you know that's how we're going to interact with it. That's why this is. So you know, making that connection between we as human beings looking at a picture, looking at you know, through our eyes, and what can you do with that mathematically? We need to transform a computer vision problem from being a you know photographic problem to being a math problem. How do we do that? Well, this is this is conceptually an important place to start is that every photo is just a matrix of numbers. So everybody's seen one of these. I'm just going to deal with the the, uh, the layout. We don't do uh, console-based uh, presentations. Uh, everybody's seen, you know, a neural. Raise your hand. Have you seen one of these neural network diagrams like this? Uh, these are awful. I mean, they're not. Uh, they don't explain a whole lot. Uh, they're never. They always say hidden layer one, two, three, which doesn't tell you anything about what's what's really going on the inside. Uh, but the input layer is a photograph, and the output layer is is it a cat? Is it a dog? Is it something? And then there's magic in between. And so conceptually, I just wanted to, 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 to simplify this and make this something that's uh, accessible uh, because it, it's not that hard. Uh, and so what I want to you think about is think about a Plinko board. And think about the fact that you're making a Plinko board. So you've got this piece of wood, pegs, and each peg has some properties of that peg, which when the Plinko hits that peg, it's either going to right or left. To the next peg, and then right to left to the next peg, right? And so we start out by dropping an image at the top. The, 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 the image is your Plinko. And it hits the first neuron in your neural network. And it either goes right or left based on the properties of the peg and the properties of that image. And then it, on the next peg, again and again and again. And in a deep neural network, you hear people talk about deep learning, uh, there might be a hundred layers there. And at each layer, there might be you know a thousand nodes across. But at the end of the day, this is all that's happening, is that your picture of a cat is hitting these Plinko pegs and eventually falls into the cat bucket at the bottom. All right? So if you look at one of those Plinko pegs, uh, you know, you've got input data coming in. There are weights associated with, associated with that peg, they're called weights, that determine whether or not you, know, you make it to the next peg. You put those things together, you start to come up with that, that picture of things. So we talked about the, you know, the image is just a bunch of numbers. Uh, this is a demonstration of how we'll transform your large image of a cat, there's a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels, into a single binary, is this a cat or not a cat? Uh, at, at parts of that neural network, we need to reduce the problem. We need to reduce that picture, because a thousand by a thousand is too many. Uh, it's not a single, you know, Boolean yes or no. Uh, and part of that reduction, is to try to capture the essence of what's in the picture, uh, but in a smaller matrix. And so what we'll do is we'll, it's called convolving. Uh, convolving is to drag this frame across your image and run, really, it's just a little bit of math, uh, to take those nine values at, at one of those filters and do matrix multiplication and come up with just one value. And so you're shrinking the image without losing the features on the image. And the math's not that hard. But you don't need to do it. It's, but it's nice to know what it's doing. Uh, so if the right side is your filter and the left side is your is your actual RGB value, uh, you know, two times zero plus ten times negative one plus sixty times one, you know, and you, and you come up with a single number. So now those nine numbers get turned into one number, but it captures some essence of that those previous nine numbers. The result of that ends up being this. Uh, ends up being this. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk over. So it's hard to see, but there's only nine buckets here. I can't see anybody, but there's nine buckets here, and there's an input image. It's the same input image all across. And, the, and think about this as the Plinko board. This is the first row of pegs on the Plinko board. But it's 
it's a whole matrix of ones and zeros in this case of black or white pixels on that floor. As it falls through, uh, when you first start out in a neural network, it's all a bunch of snow. It's all a bunch, it looks like a, a television set that's, that's scrambled up, it's just random noise. But as you train this neural network, it begins to take some shape and you start to see some things fall through. But at the, once it's done training, you run this thing, this image falls to this filter and there's only one value at the end. This is, a, this is the fourth uh, bucket, actually the, the fifth bucket, zero base, zero one, two, three. Uh, this is what that, that, that neural network is visualizing. So the inception, inception model we showed a little bit ago, uh, if you break that down and visualize its layers, it looks like this. This is, this is from the inception model. Uh, and this is faces, cars, elephants, and chairs. So if we pointed at an elephant, we have an elephant. No hot dogs? No hot dogs. At the lowest, you know, at the first levels, what you see are just edges, just lines, not real features. And you know, in that, in the, with the four picture, right? as you get deeper and deeper in that neural network, they start taking shape. They start looking like real faces. And so, uh, you start capturing style. You capture in edges. You start capturing features, uh, and, and that's. Uh, it's got some really interesting implications, especially when it breaks down and pulls out styles for people. Raise your hand, have you seen the, the thing where they have a style transfer where you've got a, a famous painting like Monet's Water Lilies and you take a picture of your kids and they combine them together? Uh, so what they're doing there is they've taken this inception model where, again, there's, there's multiple layers of this neural network and it starts capturing styles in one layer and capturing content in another. And we end up optimizing, uh, taking a picture of your kids or whatever it is, and uh, morph morphing that picture until it matches the style, until that neural network identifies, identifies it as being uh, from that painter. Let's go ahead and run the more of that. a famous painting called a mosaic. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're taking the webcam, we're capturing a frame off the webcam, and uh, we're adding noise and morphing that image uh, so that it starts triggering the trained neural network that has been, been trained to identify that mosaic image. And we're able to do that fast enough that we can actually generate this new image. Uh, let's do the let's do the uh, Is your CPU getting hot right now? <laughs> it's using the GPU. GPU. For this. Yeah. Yeah, so this is we're good at mm -hmm. good at Yeah. We did a couple of others. Oh yeah, the, 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 this would be a good aha, uh -huh for yeah. sure. <laughs> so we're painting, again, we're essentially creating a painting. Um, and this is all programmatic, which is pretty cool. Yeah, we're, I mean, this is somewhere around 25 frames a second at this point, but it's not bad. Yeah, this isn't, the, this isn't a 1080, so. <laughs> no. We tried doing like stereo pass through, so like an Oculus or something like that, and try to do like a, an overlay head, or, or overlay, I'm sorry, a 
uh, of this? Yeah. No, uh, this is om is almost entirely to show off. Uh, it's like the uh, a lot like the air hockey bug. There's no practical application for that. There's no. Uh, we're just showing off. So we did an AI summit in St. Louis, September 17th, and um, and uh, so oh, here we'll get to the rest of these things. You know, the real applications are are identifying uh, what is benign versus malignant breast cancer. Right? Is it just ones and zeros? It's just numbers. So we can train a neural network to identify, just like your face, just like your cat, to start to identify cancer. And that's a good thing. So, uh, and this is already in use. This isn't our code, but I've been you know, reading about this for now for years. Um, this is actually one of the things that inspired me to get into computer vision, um, although I did AI back in college, is that lives are being saved. Um, and uh, so there's two types of, of machine learning. It's unsupervised and supervised machine learning. Supervised is that you have, you know, it's like having a, a thousand pictures of a cat and it says the word cat, a thousand pictures of a dog, it says the word dog, and you can train it, it's supervised, you, 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 it's pre-labeled. And then there's unsupervised where you have no idea what you're looking at, and, and that's all of this data, uh, 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 it's one way to look at all this data, you, you can look at more of this breast cancer data uh, to do that. Uh, and so what I'm told is that uh, uh, oncologists had uh, Six markers, six or seven markers they would look for in these images uh, of the of the mammograms, uh, or it's not mammogram, that's a that's a biopsy, uh, stain of biopsy, and they set uh, they set unsupervised learning uh, machine learning to, to try to replicate that and detect it and come up with its own, own uh, uh, sort of you know groupings by classification to identify unknown parts. Uh, after they let the, they let this thing run for uh, for a weekend, it came back and showed all six or seven of those markers, and then three or four more markers that hadn't been known about before. And today, they're using all 10 or 11 markers. The oncologists just, you know, with their eyes, they, um, so that's pretty neat. That's pretty good. They were like, oh yeah, those are markers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we use really, really simple stuff, as you can tell here, but the, the top frame uh, came of a webcam frame, just, you know, four pictures uh, right after each other. Uh, we enhance the colors a little bit. We can tell you what your heartbeat is while you're doing it. Um, live in camera, that's pretty pretty slick. Uh, here's a really cool one. Uh, so this is, uh, this has got freaking lasers on it. Uh, and so it uses computer vision to, uh, again, pull off of a webcam, it looks at a mosquito and it figures out whether it's a male or female. And if it's fam female, lasers. If it's male, no lasers. And so what it ends up being is a wall that only lets, it's a filter that only lets males like through. the best bug zapper I've ever heard of. Yeah. That's well, I mean, if you've got malaria and you're worried about spreading malaria, you just kill all the women and then you are not pretty much. I don't mean chauvinist, I'm just from in a mosquito population. I'm sorry. In a mosquito population, that's how you do it, right? You kill the women and then you don't have more children that are spreading that malaria. So yeah. That's pretty slow. Um, yeah. So, so we do some more. Uh, and this, just as an aside, I really like this. Uh, you saw the object detection. Uh, we've been watching some other people intentionally print up things that look to a human being, like a turtle, for example. This is a 3D print. Uh, 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 but it's classified as a rifle. So if you were to walk through an airport with this turtle and they're using this object detection, so this is called uh, uh, adversarial perturbed, which is like, you can tell like one of us made up that term, it's fantastic, to take, again, take an object, and so and there's all sorts of examples of this, but it looks to us like a turtle, but uh, this is triggering, you know, in that neural network, all the rifle. Yeah. So does a normal turtle register as a rifle? No, 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 no normal turtle all day long is a turtle, but this one has been painted on purpose, not painted, but, but that's a print on purpose, so that that print of a skin, have you seen people that do, uh, yeah. the, with with uh, with makeup and they'll paint eyes on themselves and they're just trying to fool the face detection systems. That's what this is. So it's intentionally perturbed. Yeah. <laughs> but how does it? Like, has anyone researched how that looks like a rifle to a? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, they probably made it because they knew how it would work. They had to. They reverse it. Yeah. The yeah. Specific. Well, way. you come back. So you got this right. Right. So. So if you know. That, that that frame off the web off the camera, you want it to fall into the elephant category, even though it's a chair. Uh, you know, forget about the edges. 
you're going to, uh, and this is, it's too obvious to human beings, but you don't want to be sure of that. So you're going to start painting these patterns on it, but in a subtle way that a human being wouldn't pick up. Uh, and so that you'll get enough things fall through the edge, and everything's going to fall through the edge. So you're going to get some percentage of your, of your, of your you know, total <coughs> images are going to, or chair images are going to fall through the first layer. But you want to make it to that last layer to be identified as an elephant. So there are things that we wouldn't identify as an elephant, but they were specifically designed for this neural network. And the, way that, the reason that works is because, and this only works on the inception model, is if you publish your model. Uh, and Google, everybody's publishing their models now. Uh, so you can go download, and it's a, you know, it's a 300 meg file, this model, and go look at it, and then go intentionally perturb some other object to fit this model. So, so do we in the future have to worry about people socially engineering AI? Oh yeah, oh no, not future, right now. Right now? Yeah, right now. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, we, <laughs> If you don't think that next week I'm going to have one of these printed up, oh, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> you I'm going to hand them to people that go to the airport. <laughs> 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 have you seen the clothes that they're selling now already with like faces on them? Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
Uh, we literally put the machine together on the drive down here. So this, this, he, Tim re-imaged this machine yeah. before we came down. So it really wasn't much to get. The hardest part was getting open CV and everything installed on it. Really not ground because it's, it's slow on a on a 4G network. Did your question or? Yeah, so for like, like really specific stuff, like Samsung and Apple, so like the face ID and stuff like that, I guess they trained it. I guess it's unpublished, so you wouldn't know how to do stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, Microsoft. Um, do we do? you just say Microsoft? Is that what you said? Uh, just like Android and iOS. Oh! Facial recognition now to unlock phones and things like that. But they said they. They're not publishing that, right? So facial recognition is a little bit of a different, right? Because how can it train on your image over and over again? It's, it's, right. uh, so they're not using, they're not, they're not using neural nets to do that. They're not training neural nets to recognize your face. Um, although that would be better. That's uh, what I said for the Apple one, there's neural nets to train their AI to No, it's not possible. It's completely impossible to, to recognize your face. Oh, okay. Because you didn't submit a thousand samples of your face to Apple. <laughs> or maybe you did. You are when you're using their phone. I hear you <laughs> But when you first buy it and you first sell it, there's no way that it's been trained to do that. Now, what I do believe is it's probably been trained to, to, to measure the distance between your pupils and to find your pupil. That's a trivial problem, just to find key points on your face, no matter which way you're looking at it, to measure the distances and use that initially as a way to unlock the phone. And that probably works well enough until it gathers more data. And you don't need a neural network for that. You can just use OpenCV. Oh my god, clever math we use so far. I've, I've read that one issue with training is that the, the neural net for image recognition that may be picking out on on other bits in the image other than what you're intending yeah. for and is recognizing recognizing that. You know, if, if you're if all you you're trying to tell have training how to tell a wolf from a lion and all your wolf pictures are are have a green back yes green background on yep. the line pictures that have background graph you know the graphs that it may be picking up on the right. different backgrounds. So the, the question is that uh, or the comment is that that uh, depending on the data you train it with you may be keen off the wrong feature so again if you have all of your pictures of giraffes happen to have the green ball in it that's in the giraffe cage at the zoo uh, and then you think you're doing a great job by identifying uh, giraffes, but the next, the next time you put a picture of a lion with a green ball in it, you go, oh, that's a giraffe. And that's a, that, so that's called overfitting. That's a huge problem uh, in, in neural networks and training neural networks. It's called overfitting, which is to say that you've trained your neural network to be really good at, at doing uh, uh, a prediction based on your data set. And if your data was not you know, clean, right, it had a, again, a picture of a, a green ball or something, and that's why you see some, you know, a lot of these sort of pictures, like this cat, is it's, it's very isolated of the cat, but it's probably picking up grass as well. That becomes a feature that gets trained in, and so you want cats not on grass. You want cats in, in various places, on cars and in hot balloons. I don't know what I'm, what I'm saying. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, read, I read about the one about coyotes and wolves, and it was picking up on the snow yeah. versus the, who was it? It was like Google's was yeah. like story. Yeah, yeah, it's really, when you look at that, that the, the, the image net, right? It's, because those are all individual images. Oh, and by the way, they're tiny. I mean, you, you think, oh, I'm training on this big 300 pixel. No, no, no. They're all like 28 pixels by 28 pixels or 32 pixels. They're tiny. So what you're actually getting on there is nothing. And that's because, well, we're lazy and we like to, we act, we act like there's, you know, this, this great revolution of, of technology that's just, just happened and it's not. It's, we got, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, so, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, what do you think about the Intel's uh, neural net on a stick platform? Neural net on a stick? Yeah, they're making like a specific uh, hardware for it. It's like a USB dongle. Oh, I think Intel is desperate to get back in the game. The video owns it right now. Nvidia owns it. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, I don't take anybody seriously. That so, so if you, if you, so, is in an earlier talk yesterday about something else, and so you know, go find the people that are amazing at the thing and, and, and figure out what they're doing and what they're doing. Um, you know, the top twenty. Uh, people doing computer vision or AI uh, neural nets in the world. I mean, they're all doing TensorFlow. They're all doing, you know, they're, they're using they're using NVIDIA and CUDA. They're, I mean, so, so you don't fight a problem, you don't need to fight. Don't fight a battle, you don't need to fight. To, to fight, go use what the best people are using, at least initially, until you feel like you need to go veer off and make your own path. Uh, but, but no. NVIDIA has a, a small uh, graphic card designed for, you know, tiny projects that uh, it's about the size of a credit card. And I would trust that one over a, over a flash drive size. 
Awesome, thank you. Well, you know, when do you need tiny processing anyway? So most of the work is in training the neural, neural network, not running the neural network. Think, think of the, the Plinko board. Most of the work is training your Plinko board so you've got all the right weights on those pegs. To actually run the Plinko board is nothing. Just drop the Plinko through there. There's no real processing required to run the neural network. All the processing is required to train the neural network. Which, so you're, you're, you're moving compute. You know, it, you know, 20 years ago, we would do all the computation when we get the image. There's no way you could do real-time anything because there's too much math involved in dealing with that image. Today, we do most of our compute ahead of time training this neural network. And then when you actually run it, it's not, there's no real CPU, GPU, almost nothing is being done to just say, is this a cat or not? Um, it's all the training of the network. In the That's first why course. some companies are, are making their model where they train data, and then they sell the trained data to other companies so that they can just run it on that trained data. Yeah. So doing your work on a desktop with a NVIDIA 1080 Ti is a fantastic card, and it's relatively inexpensive. Yeah, it'd be fast. Other questions? Uh, yeah, well, I, um, this, the coolest project we've done, uh, I can't talk about, but I, I can talk about in general terms. And it's only because they're going to go out and sell this to their customers. But there is a company that deals in currency, and uh, counterfeiting is a big problem. Uh, and it's a, it's a global uh, company that does global currency. And so we built um, software that uh, uh, if you have that currency, that, that coin or bill or whatever it is, uh, with computer vision, we can, uh, within three seconds, tell you if they've ever seen that coin before, right? And so, if you think about the way that a human being, a numismatist, would look at a coin, they're looking at features on the coin, they're looking at scratches and dents and colors. Numismatists, that is somebody who specializes in uh, at coins, for example. Uh, a coin collector. Coin collector. So when they look at coin, you know, they don't, you know, they don't look at it like a, like a photograph. Like if you were doing a 10i reverse image search, you know, you're looking at the photograph, how similar is this photograph to another photograph, right? But you're gonna miss if the coin is rotated, if the coin is at an angle, if there's different lighting, you're gonna miss, you know, a human being doesn't miss that. They, they don't even notice that. They're just looking for those features. In fact, and they can, you know, uh, look at what features should be there versus what shouldn't be there. And so that's what we wrote for them is that same sort of thing to say, we can identify counterfeit coins, we can identify if you've seen this, this coin or bill uh, previously, uh, but uh, that's pretty wicked cool. Yeah? What is the time factor versus resolution and accuracy? Have you looked at any of those? It sounds like you're dealing with a rock curve here. Yeah, so, you know, again, ImageNet is a pretty small image. Uh, it's not even 320 by 240. The smaller the image, the better. Uh, you know, uh, the, you know, even if you have large images, you're downsampling them to make them computable in a reasonable amount of time, right? Uh, because I, I don't want to start on a wait for two weeks for something to compute in my, my lab, and I'm not going to go give Amazon $3,000 to compute it, you know, in two days in their labs. Uh, so it turns out that being clever is a lot better than having a lot of money. Uh, and so if you, again, so, so I, I showed earlier the, the real-time edge detection, right? Uh, we use that to cheat a lot. Uh, because when you could take, again, a full color, large resolution image, cheat a little bit, shrinking it down a little bit, doing a Gaussian blur on it because you really only care about where something is, generally speaking, do edge detection. Now you're just doing black and white, just zeros and ones. Oh my God, now suddenly your, you know, your four meg PNG file right from a single frame turned into, you know, I don't know, less, less than 100, you know, 100 kilobytes, right? And maybe if you're lucky, it's less than 100 bytes by the time you're done with it. Now we can go do some path on it. Now we can go send that through neural and do training. So, uh, so the first instinct for most people most is to throw more fire, more horsepower at it. That is the wrong instinct. Uh, be clever first. So I was very, very lucky that I grew up in the days of floppy disks, and, and you know you had 720k uh, to store all of your data. You know, and you couldn't go over. There's no. Oh no, you could you could punch a hole and then put the disk over. Get another 720, right? Or it was 360, 360 total 720. Uh, that forced us, you know, that forced us. It's the famous quote from Bill Gates, why would anybody need more than, what, 64K of memory or something like that, right? That, people that grew up in that kind of, like, um, you tell your kids, like, you don't know what it's like, we walked uphill both ways. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <four -day laughs> some new programmer is talking about, like, you have no idea how good you have it, but I feel so lucky that I went through that, that 
Because every problem we look at, we, we don't think, well, let's just throw some more CPU at it or some more GPU at it. How can we rethink this problem and make it a simpler problem? Uh, and, you know, Edges is really slick. Like, that's totally, nobody talks about that, but that's a really slick way of, of, of you think about the cap. I'm just looking at the edges only. You get just as much data out of that. But is there a time function for determination against some trust factor or accuracy that it is a cat? Size versus time versus accuracy. Has that been work been done yet? I'm not aware of it. Uh, the you know it's not just cat at this point, right? It's the classification for all kinds of cats, right. tabby cats and male cats and female cats and cats and here and cats and there, and there's multiple cats versus one cat and young cat versus old cat. There's a whole lot of classification. When you think about the problem of uh, detection, right? What what is in this image? Is it it's a cow dog, whatever? It's not one neural net that says, oh, there's a cow and a dog and a ball. It's a thousand neural nets. It's one neural net that, that's looking for a golf ball. One neural net's looking for a tractor. One neural net's looking for a cow. One neural net's for, looking for a cat, or maybe specific kinds of cats. But you run all thousand of those neural nets at the same time on the same image on a thousand virtual machines. Now you've got in real time. Now you've got that's why Google's Google, right? So the trick is not, let's build some really complex single neural network that can do everything at once. It's just to do one thing. And so there's not just a cat, but there's a tabby cat and an adult cat. And so in that sense, they do throw money at it. Yes, sir? So if, if you're building a, building a system that needs to be able to recognize a number of different things, does each of the, each of the patterns require a different neural net? So you basically have to keep switching context to Try out, try out possible matches one at a time. Well, uh, this is where I you know, kind of come back to being clever. Um, you simplify your problem. You don't throw a whole image of a baseball card at a single neural net. You do uh, edge detection first, and you are you look specifically for certain parts of the card that are different and that are unexpected. Unexpected features, and you isolate your problem down to a smaller subset. And now I've got a known set of classes, right? I'm looking for, you know, if I'm trying to classify, for example, I've got a, I've got a known set of cards I'm going to classify it as. Uh, so I simplify the problem. I isolate the region I'm really looking for, identifying markers. And I've got a known set of classes. So we're back to supervised learning. I've got some pre-labeled data now. I can do a neural net, but I'm not doing a neural net on the whole baseball card. I'm doing a neural net on just a couple of different corners of the baseball card. Being clever. Well, thank you.